Hello everybody, welcome back to Art Science Wonder. This is going to be episode two of the podcast. We have a lot to get to today, so I'm just going to go ahead and get right to it. Um, the first news is going to be some pretty interesting news about um, a GMO tomato as an edible COVID vaccine. Now, for some people, this is going to scare them. Um, you know, people think GMO and oh my gosh, uh, Monsanto and all these other things that are negatively associated with uh, GMOs. Um, but in this case, this is a very um, useful uh, way of using a GMO and very interesting as well. So um, this is uh, was originally in an article that I saw in Spanish um, because it's a Mexican scientist who is working on this vaccine. Um, so this was posted um, on Alliance for Science by uh, Cornell University um, by Daniel Norero, May 6, 2020. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and get to it. While large companies and public sector consortiums in the United States, Canada, China, and Europe are running at full speed to develop a vaccine grown in genetically modified tobacco plants, a research group at a Mexican university is working towards the same objective, but with a different and innovative strategy. They're using bioinformatics and computational genetic engineering to identify candidate antigens for a vaccine that can be expressed in tomato plants. Eating the fruit from these plants would then confer immunity against COVID-19. At the time I write these lines, there are already more than 3.6 million people reportedly infected by the COVID-19 pandemic and some 252,000 deaths globally. In the U.S., which has the world's highest rate of infection, COVID-19 deaths have surpassed deaths from cancer, coronary heart disease, and even influenza pneumonia in just the few months since the novel coronavirus arrived. This critical situation has led the entire world to embark on a real race to develop a vaccine that immunizes the population against this new strain of coronavirus, which apparently emerged in the autumn of 2019 in China. So far, more than 100 vaccines are being investigated for COVID-19 by universities, public research centers, and especially private companies. Some are already under clinical trial. The approaches used for their production didn't differ much from the ones classically used in vaccines where the antigen, a compound of the pathogen used to generate immunity in the patient, can be the inactivated virus as well as the genetic material or a virus protein, which is grown on a large scale in kitchen kitchen in chicken eggs, mammalian insect cell tissue, or genetically modified microorganisms. Plants as vaccine biofactories. A lesser known approach to produce antigens and vaccines on a large scale is the use of plants as biofactories. The plants are genetically modified to produce, for example, virus-like particles, VLPs, which are structural proteins of the virus, or multi-epitope. Multi proteins, there you go, where different sequences of an antigen allows us to generate an immunizing and protective response in humans. The most widely used plant is, and then there's a name that I really can't pronounce, but I'll try, Nicotiana benthamiana, hmm, pretty, a close relative of tobacco due to its biomass, easy laboratory management, and rapid growth. But scientists have also worked with other crops, such as lettuce, carrots, potatoes, rice, tomatoes, and corn, among others. At the beginning of 2020, 97 experimental vaccines had been obtained with this methodology, including plant-grown antigens for HIV, polio, hepatitis B, rabies, HPV, cholera, and tuberculosis, among other pathogens. Work even has been carried out on the cultivation of plants against cancer and autoimmune diseases. Wow, that's really cool. Some of the plant-based vaccines that have made it to advanced clinical trials include a flu vaccine developed by 
Medigago, a von Hofer malaria vaccine. Fonofer? Um, yeah, let's let's just forget that I even said that, right? Okay. <laughs> anyway, a malaria vaccine and ZMAP, a three monocle antibody serum developed by Kentucky Bioprocessing, which has already been used with patients in outbreaks of Ebola from 2014 to 2015 and 2018 to 2019 in Africa. These vaccines were obtained through cultivation of GM tobacco. Currently, plant-based drugs are already a reality and at least one has entered the market. Tally glucurase alpha, an enzyme grown in GM carrots and obtained in bioreactors, which is prescribed as replacement therapy for Goucher disease. Hopefully I pronounced that right as well. So, um, okay, so they show a figure basically in figure A where they're growing plants and bacteria and then they have an agro infiltration um, plant incubation, protein purification, extraction, and then a biomass harvest. Um, and it says in figure one, the general scheme for recombinant protein production in plants using agrofiltration, um, the recombinant protein antigen expression cycle takes six to ten days starting with agrofiltration of growth plants and agrobacterium. Agrofiltration is accomplished by submerging plants in bacterial culture, harboring plasmid vectors coding for genes of interest, and subjecting them to vacuum pulse to force the bacterial culture in B. Plants are incubated for several days and then harvested by strictly controlled protocol designed to prevent the release of genetically engineered bacteria into the environment. Subsequently, the extraction of recombinant proteins is carried out and the purification to make the recombinant drug or vaccine. The advantages of vaccines cultivated in plants include the facilitation of their transport and storage without the need for a cold chain which lowers cost. In addition, there is no need to worry about contamination of toxins and pathogens for humans, a risk that can occur in the production of vaccines in micro microorganisms or mammalian cultures. Efforts in COVID-19 from the public and private sectors. Within the COVID-19 vaccine race, the strategy of plant cultivation, also known as biofarming or molecular farming, hasn't been left out. Two companies already mentioned are working on COVID-19 plant-based antigens by expressing VLPs in GM tobacco. One of them is Medagog, those C this, whose CEO claimed the Canadian company would be able to manufacture 10 million doses per month if its innovative production method and clinical trials obtain U.S. Food and Drug Administration FDA approval. So that's always, that's always a thing, right? Gotta have the FDA no matter what, um, even if it takes a long time and is in usually pretty inhibitory. But anyway, that's just my little side note there. So um, on the other hand, the American company uh, Kentucky Bioprocessing is using a fast-growing GM tobacco of its own and publicly stated that it is already conducting preclinical tests and possesses the ability to manufacture up to 3 million doses per week. So they have got the funding. <laughs> funding secured right there. But yeah, I mean obviously it's uh gm so um interesting uh so the third private sector research group is an alliance between the u.s company iBio and china's beijing cc farming which are combining the cultivation of vlps from covid19 and a uh lichenase carrier amino stimulatory adjunct in GM tobacco. Meanwhile, the public sector is not far behind. The University of California, San Diego is working on an innovative collaborative project between internal research groups to develop a microneedle patch vaccine that uses proteins grown in GM plants. So we did that um, 
we did talk about the microneedle patch, I believe, in our last episode. So um, that's also a really great idea, too. On the other hand, the Center for Research in Agricultural Genomics of Spain will develop antigens for COVID-19 and GM lettuce and tobacco, and the inter international project New Cotiana, which works on the development of medicines and vaccines in plants with funding from the European Union, has released the complete genetic sequence of Nicotina benthamina in order to accelerate the development of the plant-based vaccine. Um, this, this last work was led by IBMCP Spain and Queensland University of Technology Australia. So what if the plant, if the vaccine could be eaten instead of injected? So they're talking about how uh, basically it would um, be absorbed and stuff by the body, which is going to be important. So um, although the plant-based vaccines mentioned above have certain advantages over con con conventional sorry, <laughs> vaccines, their route of administration continues to be through um, parenteral parenteral hmm parenteral yeah never heard of that word gonna have to look that up i guess we should all look that up if we don't know what it is right parenteral injection almost sounds like um like parent i don't know huh the jab that's what it is that can cause so much pain in children or to children so, but what if instead of using GM tobacco and purifying antigens to make an injectable vaccine, we could eat a GM fruit that directly confers immunity? Although something like this is not yet in clinical use, it is not a novelty in experimental terms. Interesting. So since the 1990s, several research groups have worked on the modification of edible plants and fruits that generate an immune response in the in intestinal epithelium of animals after oral intake genetically modified crops still at the experimental not con commercial level used to create edible vaccines range from potato tomato lettuce papaya carrot and rice to quinoa alfalfa banana and algae that is a long list that's very good they have focused on hepatitis b uh rotavirus norwalk virus malaria, cholera, and autoimmune diseases, diseases, among others. So, this is a very long article, and it continues. Um, but that gets the gist across, and of course, this article will be linked in the description on YouTube. So, the next one um, is actually uh, pretty cool. Uh, this one is by newatlas.com um, under the science section. Um, it was published May 10th, 2020, uh, written by Rich Harity. Um, it's called Experimental Gene Therapy Prevents Obesity, Builds Muscle Without Exercise, or Dieting. Now, I would like to say that I did work on a project um, with a startup in Austin um, a couple years ago, uh, and it was very, very cool. So I basically was a lab tech for a startup that was working on some um, open source, uh, you know, full statin gene therapy. Um, and I believe it could be possible that um, this uh, new research that just came out could be based on that open source work. So um, I definitely um, uh, applaud them. I don't know if that's basically giving myself a pat on the shoulder or not, but um, I do applaud them for, uh, you know, hiring me for a while for the, I believe it was about six months-ish duration of time that um, they were doing this project. Um, it was very, very fun, and um, I'll talk a little bit more about that once I explain what all this is. <laughs> so, it says, an animal study saw mice fed high-fat diets build muscle and become stronger without exercise or becoming obese. So, in this compelling new study, led by scientists from Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, has found a novel gene therapy um, that can prevent obesity and build muscle without the need for additional exercise in mice being fed a high-fat diet. 
so found, I guess we found some research. <laughs> all right, so folostatin, a protein expressed in almost all animal tissue, was first discovered and described in the late 1980s. Initially investigated for its role as a reproductive hormone, folostatin was subsequently found to influence a number of cellular processes, including muscle proliferation. Prior animal studies have demonstrated gene therapies designed to amplify folostatin expression can counteract certain degenerative muscle diseases. Um, so that would be like, for instance, sarcopenia, which is like the, the gradual um, loss of muscle mass as you age. So sarcopenia is um, that process, um, and it's very harmful, unfortunately, of course, to the body because um, your body needs to have a correct balance of muscles in order to, for it to move properly, function properly, um, all sorts of stuff. So um, this new research explored whether this kind of therapy could help treat osteoarthritis uh, by increasing muscle mass and reducing metabolic inflammation linked to obesity. Obesity is the most common risk factor for osteopro osteoarthritis, excuse me, explains Farshid Gulak, senior investigator on the new research. Being overweight can hinder a person's ability to exercise and benefit fully from physical therapy. The study involved young mice receiving a single gene therapy treatment designed to enhance full statin expression. The animals were fed a high fat diet and the progression of post joint injury osteoarthritis was observed. Uh, Gulak uh, describes the subsequent re results as profound with the animals building muscle mass without gaining additional weight despite being fed a high fat diet and not exercising any more than normal. The gene therapy notably mitigated cartilage degeneration, uh, synovial inflammation, and bone remodeling linked to joint injury and osteoarthritis. We have identified here a way to use gene therapy to build muscle more quickly, says Goliak. Um, so basically, I just want to go on a side note. Um, the, what the work that our lab was doing was we were using um, circular DNA um, as a injection. Um, so um, basically, it would be uh, they would allow the cells, okay, in your uh, fat tissue uh, or fat cells in the in around the stomach um, to absorb the gene therapy or the circular DNA um, through its cell walls. Uh, basically, it would kind of rec maybe recognize it as its own and then code it into its own cells, then creating a signal. Um, that would basically go up to the brain and signal the production of this hormone, you know, but to like only a certain degree. So um, that's why the dosage was important. Um, so basically, um, you know, it would allow for your body to, in, in, a, in a weird roundabout way, um, produce more full statin naturally. Uh, because it was more of a signal and it wasn't something that you were taking or having to consume or trying to find a more like bioavailable um, format of it or whatever. So um, that's just how it worked. Um, okay, let's see. So I uh, lost my place now. <laughs> so we've identified here a way to use the gene therapy to build muscle quickly. Um, it had a profound effect uh, in the mice and ke and uh, kept their weight in check, suggesting a similar approach may be effective against arthritis, particularly in cases of morbid obesity. This is not the first time folostatin gene treatment has been proposed for human therapies. It is being investigated as a potential therapy for cancer, kidney disease, and cystic fibrosis fibrosis. This is huge, guys. Wow. Um, super excited here. So a phase one human trial testing the safety of full statin gene therapy for Becker muscular dystrophy suggested the treatment generated no adverse effects. However, efficacy at this stage is unclear. So 
This new research suggests full statin gene therapy generates a number of multifactorial effects, not just influencing muscle mass, but also broad metabolic activities that can somehow uh, counter caloric intakes in high-fat diets. Uh, Guliak is realistic about how far from a human, a human clinical treatment his team's research currently may be, but this promising finding does point to intriguing future gene therapies in humans that could treat obesity without major dietary change or build muscle in subjects unable to exercise. Something like this could take years to develop, but we're excited about its prospects for reducing joint damage related to osteoarthritis, as well as possibly being useful in extreme cases of obesity, uh, concludes Gulilak. I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, so the new research was published in the Journal of Science Advances. Really hope that's like free to the public, but probably not. So, but that's okay. You know what? What are you going to do at a rat right now? Oh, wait. Oh, wait. No, there it is. I think that's the full thing. Actually, it does look like it's full. Great. Great, great, great. How cool. Anyway, if you guys are interested in that, it's in that article. Very nice. Okay, so um, just want to say also, um, if you guys are interested in this type of thing, gene therapies, um, topics along uh, that line of work, um, there's a lot of interesting work being done um, in that area. And um, because of this work, I was also inadvertently in this documentary um, on Netflix about biohacking. So um, biohackers are very interesting people. They're a very interesting community. Here it is. It's called Unnatural Selection on Netflix. It's still on there. Um, and I even know this guy in the main picture here, um, David. So, or at least I know him from the internet for like many years. So, and then um, uh, it's kind of, uh, you know, g a lot of people ex associate um, gene therapies with, oh, that's eugenics or, you know, weird stuff like that, right? Um, but this is, uh, gene therapies are, are actually becoming prevalent enough that um, some doctors in, in certain states of America are already recommending gene therapies to people who have inherited diseases that might be cured by gene therapy. So um, there are many um, inheritable or inherited diseases um, that could be cured uh, by gene therapy one day um, and some already today. Um, one of them is a genetic form of blindness, and um, it's actually in the Netflix documentary. It's really cool. Um, so, spoiler, the, this, there's a, a kid gets um, cured of blindness because of gene therapy. And so, it's, a ve it's basically modern medicine. Um, it's nothing to be afraid of. Um, it's, it's going to be, you know, very good for humanity. It already is doing really good work. Um, it's helping many people, and it will continue to help many people um, with their illness or illnesses. So, um, but I do suggest if you are going to watch that Netflix documentary, um, I do feel like there was a bit of a slant uh, in the Netflix documentary. Um, and I also recommend watching this, um, this uh, video on YouTube called The Biohacking Company Testing Drugs on Itself. And it was a... Uh, kind of like an HBO short. So I haven't seen the HBO one, if there is one out there um, on this uh, particular topic or related to this Netflix documentary, but um, it, it is important that they uh, talk about these things because um, basically we have, uh, you know, a system in the United States that I believe makes it a little bit harder for biotech companies. And the reason I say that is because um, a biotech company in the United States is more likely to turn over than any other type of company um, in the U.S. Um, so that means, what I mean by turnover is they're the most likely um, company to fail. Uh, and a lot of that is due to kind of a, pay, a huge paywall when it comes to clinical trials and getting through uh, things passed to the FDA so that you can uh, bring them to market. 
so that you can um, continue your business. So it's with most um, research and development uh, or the sciences, uh, typically government infrastructures tend to fund research and development. And the reason is because it takes so long to finally, if ever, create something that you can actually um, basically get your return on investment for. So kind of like basic business there um, is that if you, you, in order to accomplish something and not be in the hole or in debt severely, um, you need to make your money back. So it's a very, very like fundamental principle of uh, business. Um, and uh, that's why a lot of research and development is funded heavily by governments because there is a huge chance that you may never get your money back and that's okay um, but that also means that there is a responsibility for like uh, government institutions or you know private funders or somebody you know <laughs> somebody's got to pay for it right so in order for science um, and medicine to happen so uh, anyway so I do suggest watching the um, this uh, this um, Vice News um, YouTube video first because when I watched the Netflix documentary, I was expecting something very different, and um, I kind of, I kind of thought that they, um, they filmed things in a very specific way, you know, like kind of journalism does sometimes. They film in a certain way. They ask questions a certain way. Um, they cut they cut things up in certain ways. Um, that can be very biased, so, um, and you kind of see it, like, with, <laughs> and this is probably a bad example, but, like, with shows like Tiger King or something where you're, like, they've got a close-up this of this lady's face, and they're trying to say, oh, we know for a fact that she's a murderer, like, we don't know that, like, even if, you know, like, things can be very anecdotal, um, you know, they can make slant things to, to so that they sell, you know, more and so that it get, gets more attention and more eyes and it, and it's more, uh, <laughs> like as, 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 com as completely entertaining as they can possibly make it. So, um, I think that, um, the person that they were kind of being biased against, uh, Aaron Trawick was, uh, doing a lot of good work, um, despite everybody having flaws, even him, uh, you know, uh, but at least he was pushing things along. He was trying to do things in a rational uh, type way where he's like, okay, well, you know, we, we have to get things um, out there somehow. And um, But there's so many ways of, of going about things, right? I mean, so our lab open sourced, uh, you know, this gene therapy research that we did and and uh, what uh, uh, like what we made and and, and, and look, now somebody with the prestige and the money is able to do a lot more with it. And, and I don't know if that was directly because of our lab's work or another lab's work or another paper. Who knows where, where ex exactly, you know, um, they were able to do this or get this information. But um, there's so many paths um, that one can take uh, that, you know... I don't really see uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, business or doing it open source. As long as long as as long as the therapy gets out there, you know, it depends on your objective. Are you trying to get it out there fast? Are you trying to get it out there for as many people as possible? Are you trying to go the slow institutional route? Like what what route are you wanting to take? Um, it all has the same end goal. And the end goal is that we want to help people in medicine. We want to save people's lives. We want to help them live longer. So I just, I just really wanted to, um, before you guys go watch the, <laughs> the, that stuff, uh, emphasize, um, that, but they are very, very interesting, um, videos or documentaries, um, out there on biohacking and, um, you know, science that's kind of, you could call it like on the edge. Um, but it's 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 um it's really just science uh of the now you know it's modern medicine um it's just about how you get there that's really all so anyway so the next one um 
is some a little bit scary news. <laughs> uh, so this is um, on it was from sciencenews.org. It's more murder hornets are turning up. Here's what you need to know. Uh, what's getting overlooked in the furor over the world's largest hornets move to North America. Oh my God. Okay, so the Asian giant hornet is the world's largest hornet species and an invasion of the giants to North America could spell trouble for the honeybees it kills as food for its young. This is written by Susan Milius on May 29th, 2020. So let me get a drink of water here. Okay. Two new specimens of Asian giant hornet have turned up in the Pacific Northwest, suggesting that the invasive species made it through the winter despite efforts last year to stamp out the menace to North America's honeybees. A big yellow and black insect found dead in a roadway near Custer Wash has been identified as the Asian giant hornet, or Vespa mandarinia, uh, Sphevin Sphincter, Sphincter, I don't know, <laughs> I'm sure that's not his last name, but that's what it looks like, genuinely, Sphincter, with a G, though, with a G, okay, it's the same thing, but with a G, <laughs> and etymologist, I don't mean to laugh at his name, I'm sorry, uh, an etymologist at the Washington State Department of Agriculture announced May 29th. It was probably a queen, he said, from a brood in a 2019 nest and now ready to found a colony of her own. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, scary stuff, guys. Scary stuff. So... Canadian scientists have also confirmed their first giant hornet of 2020, a specimen spotted May 15th in Langley, British Columbia, dubbed the murder hornet to the annoyance of etym etymologists. The predator earns its nicknames from its proclivity to nab a honeybee, bite off the bee's head, carry it home to nourish the young hornets. Oh my gosh, right? Okay, so raiding party, uh, parties of several dozen Asian giant hornets can kill whole hives containing thousands of bees in a few hours. Those are just some of the details that make V. mandariana the newest stinging invader in years. It's a fierce-like predator, though not as apocalyptic as murder hornet, headlines have suggested. Amid the uproar over the new hornets, a few facts have been overlooked. For one, North America has previously had at least one close call, not publicized at the time, with the world's largest hornet. Unlike the current sensational invasion, however, that early episode had a happy ending, at least for the people and native insects of North America. Not so much for the hornets. What's more, these aren't the only big bad hornets that have arrived at the borders of the continent. Here's what we know so far and what we don't about Asian giant hornets and the threats they pose. Is this invasion, excuse me, invasion of the giant hornet really new? Not entirely. What's new for North America is that last year, scientists confirmed Asian giant hornets in the wild. September 2019, beekeepers tracked down and destroyed a hornet nest about the diameter of a large grapefruit near a public footpath in, I knew I was going to be able to say this, Na Nanaimo near Vancouver, Canada. Lone flying hornets also showed up on both sides of the Canada-U.S. border, one at a hummingbird feeder near Blaine Wash. But that wasn't the Asian, Asian uh, giant hornet's first touchdown on North American soil. California had an overlooked close call in 2016. It wasn't just some lone hornet hiding in a cargo container, says entomologist Alan Smith uh, Pardo, now at the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service office in Sacramento, California. He was the scientist charged with identifying any suspicious wasps or bees found in cargo or na male nationwide. As Inspector 
an inspector flagged an express package coming into the San Francisco airport without any mention of insects on its labeling, yet it held some kind of papery honeycomb-like nest. Ooh, oh my gosh. So, the inspector wondered if someone was smuggling in bees, which, U- which U.S. rules strictly ban in order to slow the influx of viruses, predatory mites, and other menaces. Smith Pardo identified the package as something even more dramatic, a whole nest of Asian giant hornets. There were no adults in the package, but plenty of pupae and larvae, he says. A few more, a few were still alive. Oh, man. So, instead of some bizarre attempt at international sabotage, the package was probably a gourmet treat or even a health aid. In their native home, collected adults Pupae and larvae are soaked in liquor, says retired etymologist uh, Zhuang Tai Chao, who studied paper wasp social behavior at the University of Georgia, as well as hornet ecology at the Taiwan uh, Forestry Research Institute. This hornet liquor, he says, is believed to ease arthritis pain. Jeez. Um, so in 2016, sounds like pseudoscience to me, but who knows if it's not been tested either way, there's plenty of other methods, maybe like that fullest gene therapy that could help with arthritis, right guys? We just read about that. How cool, right? Wouldn't that be? Anyway, so the 2016 Hornet package was opened in a secure room that keeps biological hazards from escaping. So that potential insect disaster became no more than a data point mentioned briefly on page 23 of the May 2020 issue of Insect Systematics and Diversity. The overview looked only at hornets intercepted okay, in California during one decade. So there could have been other run-ins with giants. Oh, man. Okay, so is the Asian, sorry, I'm just processing that. Is the Asian giant hornet the first hornet to try invading North America? Far from it. The hefty, though not record setting, Hornet V um, crab rose spread from Europe into New York State around the mid 19th century. Now found in scattered places east of the Rockies, the European hornet's best hornet, sorry, hornet's nest in hollow trees and cozy nooks within walls. Humans who blunder too close can get painful stings, says Bob Jacobson, a retired etymologist at Cincinnati with a long-standing interest in hornets and venoms. His cousin was stung by the species. Oh, that's not good because apparently um, people die from that um, sometimes. And I think they're, but they usually have um, already an allergy. Um, So, Like the Asian giant hornet, the European invader attacks honeybees, and Jacobson has seen it go after bumblebees too. Wow. As well as yellow jackets and some other wasps. Unlike the new invader, though, a V. Crabro hornet hunts alone. It picks off a bee on a flower or at a hive, but doesn't gang up in groups for mass slaughter of whole insect colonies. Other hornets have also turned up in North America without stirring public interest. The data search of interceptions in California between 2010 and 2018 showed that inspectors stopped four other species besides this giant in Canada just in 2019. Etymologists identified two different invasive hornet species, including V. soror, which is almost as big as the Asian, Asian giant. Whether those arrivals could make a permanent home remains to be seen. So let's back up. What are hornets, and why do people get so spooked by them? True hornets are big, predatory, colony-forming wasps in the Vespa genus. Vespa, sorry, not Vespa. Uh, Apart from the European V. Carbaro, uh, they're native to Asia. They need meat to feed their young, unlike honeybees, which collect plant pollen as baby food. 
Another difference, a honeybee dies after a single use stinger rips out of its body. Hornets, however, are among the insects that can sting and sting again. The latest hornet identification key lists 22 species, stripped and spangled in various browns and rusts, golds and bluish blacks. North America also has several native wasps popularly, popularly nicknamed hornets. These natives, however, belong on a nearby uh, but different twig of insect evolutionary tree. Why do Asian hornets attack honeybees? So the article goes on. It's a very long article, but I'll leave the rest to you guys if you want to continue reading that. So the next one is also long. What is the last one for today? Oh, I need some water, guys. Just a second. When I can afford an editor, I will definitely be getting an editor for my YouTube, guys, and my and my podcast, because I, I do already need one, but it takes me so long to, or it's taken me so far so long to prepare these videos um, or podcasts that at the moment it's not feasible. So, this next one is again on coronavirus. Um but it's interesting information and it will really help, really help us understand um, coronavirus better. So this one was written on May 28th by Dana G. Smith um, and it was in elementalmedium.com. Uh, so it's basically a, a medium article, I think, but elemental, not sure. Maybe they are the same company or maybe they're not. I don't know. So this one's titled, Coronavirus May Be a Blood Vessel Disease, which explains everything. Ah, oh, I just really need that water. These articles have been pretty long. <sighs> okay, so. In April, blood clots emerge as one of the many mysterious symptoms attributed to COVID-19, a disease that had initially been thought to largely affect the lungs in the form of pneumonia. Quickly after came reports of young people dying due to coronavirus-related strokes. Next, it was COVID toes, painful red or purple digits. What do all of these symptoms have in common? An impairment in blood circulation. Add in the fact that 40% of deaths from COVID-19 are related to cardiovascular complications, and the disease starts to look like a vascular infection instead of a purely respiratory one. Months into the pandemic, there is now a growing body of evidence to support the theory that the novel coronavirus can infect blood vessels, which could explain not only the high prevalence of blood clots, strokes, and heart attacks, but also provide an answer for the diverse set of head-to-toe symptoms that have emerged. All these COVID-associated complications were a mystery. We see blood clotting, we see kidney damage, we see inflation of the heart, we see stroke, and we see encephalitis, swelling of the brain, says William, Ellie, William Lee, MD, president of the Angiogenesis, Angiogenesis Foundation, a whole myriad of seemingly unconnected phenomenon that you do not normally see with SARS or N1H1 or, frankly, most infectious diseases. If you start to put all of the data together that's emerging, it turns out that this virus is probably a vasculotropic virus, meaning that it affects the blood vessels, says Mandeep Mehra, MD, medical director of the Brigham and Women's Hospital Heart and Vascular Center. In a paper published in April, in the scientific journal, The Lancet, Mehra and a team of scientists discovered that the SARS-CoV-2 virus can infect the endothelial cells excuse me, that line the inside of blood vessels. Endothelial cells protect the cardiovascular system, and they release proteins that influence everything from blood clotting to the immune response. In the paper, the scientists showed damage to endothelial cells in lungs, heart, kidney, and intestines with people with COVID-19. Oh, man. Okay, so the concept that's emerged is that this is not a respiratory illness alone. This is a respiratory illness to start with, 
but it is actually a vascular illness that kills people through its involvement of the vasculature, says Mehra. A respiratory virus infecting blood cells and circulating through the body is virtually unheard of. A one-of-a-kind respiratory virus. SARS-CoV-2 is thought to enter the body through the ACE2 receptor present on the surface of cells that line the respiratory tract in the nose and the throat. Once in the lungs, the virus appears to move from the alveoli to the air sacs in the lung into the blood vessels, which are also rich of the ACE2 receptors. The virus enters the lungs. It destroys the lung tissue and people start coughing. The destruction of the lung tissue breaks open some blood vessels, Meharis explains, then it starts to inflect the endothelial cell after endothelial cell creates an, a local immune response and inflames the endothelium. A respiratory virus infecting blood cells and circulating through the body is virtually unheard of. Influenza viruses like N1H1 are not known to do this, and the original SARS virus, a sister coronavirus to the current infection, did not spread past the lung. Oh, oh man, I'm getting tired, guys. Okay, other types of viruses, such as Ebola or dengue, can damage endothelial cells, but they are very different from viruses that typically infect the lungs. Um, let's see. Breher Lee, MD, a professor of microbiology at the Aiken School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, says the difference between SARS and SARS-CoV-2 likely stems from an extra protein each of the viruses requires to activate and spread. Although both viruses dock onto the cells through ACE2 receptors, another protein is needed to crack open the virus so genetic material can get into the infected cell. The additional protein the original SARS virus requires is only present in lung tissue, but the protein for SARS-CoV-2 is active and present in all cells, especially endothelial cells. In SARS-1, the protein that's required to cleave, it is likely present only in the lung environment, so, that, so that's where it can replicate. To my knowledge, it doesn't really go symptomatically, says. SARS-CoV-2 is cleaved by a protein called furin, and that's a big danger because furin is present in all our cells. It's ubiquitous. Holy cow, guys. This is insane. I mean, the more we learn about coronavirus, um, I mean, the more absolutely fascinating and terrible it is. So, um, but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see. It, se it seems like there's a possibility um, that, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll just see. We'll see, okay? Because I don't want to say anything that, that could end up being completely wrong so okay uh endothelial damage could explain the virus's weird symptoms an infection of the blood vessels would explain many of the weird tendencies of the novel coronavirus like the high rates of blood clots endothelial cells help regulate clot formation by sending out proteins that turn the coagulation system on or off the cells also help ensure that blood flows smoothly and doesn't get caught on any rough edges on the blood vessel walls. The endothelial cell layer is, a part, is in part responsible for clot regulation. It inhibits clot formation through a variety of ways, says Shinjum Sethi, MD, MHP, an interventional cardiologist at Columbia University Irving Medical Center. God, these people always have such long freaking titles. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, so if that's disrupted. You could see why that may potentially promote clot formation. So endothelial damage might account for the high rates of cardiovascular damage and seemingly spontaneous heart attacks in people with COVID-19 too. Damage to endothelial cells causes inflammation in the blood vessels, and that can cause any plaque that's ac accumulated to rupture, causing a heart attack. Oh, wow. <sighs> crazy that is just insane i am going to have to read that to myself in my head one more time 
Okay, on my own later, I guess. This means anyone who has plaque in their blood vessels that might normally have remained stable or been controlled with medication is suddenly at much higher risk of a heart attack. Oh, not good. Okay, inflammation and endothelial dysfunction promote plaque rupture. Sethi says endothelial dysfunction is linked towards worse heart outcomes, in particular myocardial infraction or heart attack. So, blood vessel damage could also explain why people with pre-existing conditions like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, and heart disease are at higher risk for severe complications from a virus that's supposed to just infect the lungs. All of those diseases cause endothelial cell dysfunction, and the additional damage and inflammation in the blood vessels caused by the infection could push them over the edge and cause serious problems. The theory could even solve the mystery of why ventilation often isn't enough to help many COVID-19 patients breathe better. Moving air into the lungs, which ventilators help with, is only one part of the equation. The exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the blood is just as important to provide the rest of the body with oxygen, and that process relies on functioning blood vessels in the lungs. If you have blood clots within the blood vessels that are required for complete oxygen exchange, even if you're moving air in and out of the airways, if the circulation is blocked, the full benefits of mechanical ventilary, ventilary, ventilatory sorry, support are somewhat thwarted, says Lee. A new paper published last week in the New England Journal of Medicine, on which Lee is a co-author, found widespread evidence of blood clots and infection in the endothelial cells in the lungs of people who died from COVID-19. This was in stark contract to people who died from H1N1, who had nine times fewer blood clots in the lungs. Even the structure of the new blood vessels was different from in the COVID-19 lungs. With many more new branches that likely formed after the original blood vessels were damaged. We saw blood clots everywhere, Lee said. We were observing virus particles filling up the endothelial cell like filling up a gamble machine. Gim gumball, sorry. Uh, the uh, endothelial cell swells and the cell membrane starts to break down. And now you have a layer of injured endothelium. Finally, infection of the blood vessels may be how the virus travels through the body and infects other organs, something that's atypical of respiratory infections. Interesting. A finally, infection of the blood cells. Vessels, not blood cells. Infection of the blood vessels may be the way the virus travels through the body and infects other organs. Interesting. I guess a vitamin C would be good too, right? I mean, some people get um, vitamin C... Uh, uh, injections. So, um, yeah, anyway, uh, endothelial cells connect the entire circula circulation system. 60,000 uh, 60, uh, miles worth of blood vessels throughout your body, says Lee. Uh, it, is this one way that COVID-19 can impact the brain? Of course, duh. Okay, and that's how it gets to the toes. We don't know the answer to that. Give me a break, guys. Like, okay, anyway. <laughs> Sorry, sometimes, sometimes, sometimes. All right, so in another paper that looked at nearly 9,000 people with COVID-19, Mehra showed that the use of statins and ACE inhibitors were linked to higher rates of survival. Sorry, I hope I'm not getting delirious, guys. I, I literally was up trying to get this darn OBS thing to like work with me for way too long so I mean I think the last video I did was 15 days ago I mean that just tells you how long I've been working on some uh, some of these uh, technical issues uh, so anyway if COVID-19 is a vascular disease the best antiviral therapy might not be antiviral therapy an alternative theory is that the blood clotting and symptoms in other organs are caused by inflammation in the body due to an overreactive immune response, the so-called cytokine um, storm. The inflammatory reaction can occur in other respiratory illnesses and, se and severe cases of pneumonia, which is why the initial reports of blood clots, heart complications, and neurological symptoms didn't sound 
the alarm bells. However, the magnitude of the problems seen with COVID-19 appear, appeared to go beyond the inflammation experience in other respiratory infections. These and some increased propensity, we think, of clotting happening with these other viruses. I think inflammation in general promotes that, Sethi says. In this over and above or unique for, is this over and above or unique for SARS-CoV-2? Or is this just because the infection is just that much more severe? I think those are all really good questions that, unfortunately, we don't have the answer to yet. So, anecdotally, Sethi says the number of requests he received as a director of the pulmonary embolism response team, which deals with the with blood clots in the lungs in April 2020, was two to three times the number in April tw- 2019. The questions he's now trying to answer is whether that's because there were simply more patients at the hospital during that month peak of the pandemic, or if COVID-19 patients really do have higher risk for blood clots. Um, so the good news is that if COVID-19 uh, is a vascular disease, there are existing drugs that can help protect against endothelial cell damage. In another New, York, U- New England Journal of Medicine paper that looked at nearly 9,000 people with COVID-19, members show that the use of statins and ACE inhibitors were linked to higher rates of survival. Statins reduced the risk of heart attacks not only by lowering cholesterol or preventing plaque, they also stabilize existing plaque meaning they're less likely to rupture if someone is on drugs. Okay, cool. That's like a pretty decent sample size, 9,000 people there. So, um, yeah, that's pretty good. So it turns out that both statins and ACE inhibitors are extremely protective on vascular dysfunction, Mahara says. Most of their benefit in the continuum of cardiovascular illness, be it high blood pressure, be it stroke, be it heart attack, be it arrhythmia, be it heart failure in any situation, the mechanism by which they protect the cardiovascular system starts with their ability to stabilize the endothelial cells. Mara continues, what we're saying is that maybe the best antiviral therapy is not actually an antiviral therapy. The best therapy might actually be a drug that stabilizes the vascular endothelial. We're building a drastically different concept. Okay, so there is the article, guys. That was very fascinating and um, definitely one of the most interesting diseases I've read about, as terrible as it is. Um, this is going to definitely help us with better treatments, hopefully higher survival rates, et cetera, et cetera. All of this is, even though it sounds daunting, is uh, it's very good news. So um, anyway, guys, or everybody... Um, it was very, uh, wonderful having you with me again. Um, as I said, these are going to continue to improve over time. The more I do, the better I'll get at this. Um, (laughs) sorry if I really fudge some things up. Um, when I'm reading, some of these words are uh, obviously very complicated and I surprise myself that even I can read a lot of them. (laughs) Um, but, uh, pronunciation may not always be correct. If you ever uh, can help me with that, if there's something that you know that I'll probably end up having to say again later and you know the proper pronunciation, (laughs) you can always, um, you know, send me a little little voice message or something with it. Uh, But I hope you guys enjoy. Um, And uh, yeah, oh, and definitely check out that, uh, those two videos uh, that I was talking about, the the Vice video and the Netflix documentary that I'm in. I am the girl with the brown hair and the purple tips. That was like a few years back already, basically. So, um, by the time it was released and all that. So, uh, it, uh, yeah. So it's like me, like maybe two and a half, maybe three years ago. (laughs) It's like been a little bit. So, um, yeah, but I'm in there many times. Girl with purple hair. I'm in a lab coat. They even interviewed me, um, but they unfortunately left that part out because they were really dedicated to um, maybe focusing on a certain narrative. So, um, but yeah, I hope you guys enjoy it um, and we'll see you soon. <laughs>